Pranakosha live stream. Hi folks, it's Matt at Pranakasha Productions, and today uh, we're doing something a little different. We're going to show you my personal teacher, Jim Johnson, who teaches me both accents and acting. And Jim is um, part of the accentsclass.com, which is about to do an online class. Registration is already open, and uh, we'll put a link in the description for that. And then, of course, um, Jim's worked with many professional actors throughout his career. He's, he's taken it to an art and a science, the, the business of accents. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to do some of that today. And he's also professor of such things at um, University of Houston. That's correct, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, so Jim, take it away and then we'll just kind of have at it. <laughs> well, yeah. So I, yeah, I, um, I teach accents. I mean, that's one of the primary things I do. I teach voice and accents for actors. Okay. In a, at the university, I teach in a BFA and an MFA program. I teach those things. And then, um, so a Bachelor of Fine Arts and a Master of Fine Arts. Okay. And yeah, then I also, <laughs> for like the last 15 years, I've been doing, um, I created a website and all these materials for actors learning accents and have worked with some other coaches on that as well. It's accenthelp.com. And okay. then the last few years I've been teaching this class um, where I do the teaching side of it. And Dan O'Day, a gentleman I work with, he does, handles sort of all the business side. Okay. And uh, it's the accents class. And yeah, we're doing registration right now. And we start it um, next week. Like we start uh, a week later, we start the class and it's, four weeks of meeting twice a week, Monday and Thursday nights. And, um, and what I'm, what I'm trying to do in that is like the first night is a big overview of it all okay. of like learning accents. What are these different elements you need to know? And then we work for the next seven sessions on seven different accents. And then over the course of the next oh. year, everybody in the class gets every single one of the downloads that I have for the website for the accent help website. So that's 50 okay. different accents that they end up with all the materials for learning. And then the, the classes that we're doing where I'm coaching people and sending them these materials in the midst of this sort of month long intensive is um, it's not only about learning those accents, but it's about trying to lay the groundwork, like create a toolbox for people learning any accent. Yeah. Right. That's what we're trying to accomplish in that period of time. Wow. So seven different accents. Wow. Yeah. Over the course of a month. So it's okay. We meet Mondays and Thursdays. And so like Thursday night, we'll start working on standard British RP. So we'll work on that accent like that evening and everyone will, you know, be doing these monologues in that accent and I'll be coaching individuals. Okay. Um, yeah. And then the next. So what does that accent sound like? So along this line, so it's the upper class British. A lot of the time when people say, so we're working sort of on the classic RP because that accent has actually changed over time. Okay. Because um, like the classic RP is what you might think of. Well, um, the Captain Picard, right? Mm -hmm. He very much utilizes that upper class sort of classic, the sort of classical classic. actor sound. Yeah, from right. England. Okay. Um, and so that's what's commonly called RP, actually, received pronunciation. Oh. But that accent has actually changed because like over time, nowadays, people don't tend to speak in that same way, and yet it's still considered RP or standard British. Um, or it's also called standard English, but most Americans, it, standard English sounds more like generican or general American, right? Right. So I tend to use standard British or RP. You know, norm, the way normal people talk. The way normal, right. <laughs> the way people really should talk. That's what exactly. it is. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, so like the classic standard British is much more like this, right? And okay. the modern standard Brits a little bit more like this. So it's a little bit, there's a slight difference in it. 
Whereas the classic mm. is a little bit more like this. There's a slight difference in that. And then there's a slight difference in the modern standard British RP. Yeah. Ooh. And that's what I want to call estuary, which is kind of a, it's kind of an accent in between Cockney and standard British, like standard British. And then you go all the way to the sort of Cockney, like working class London sort of thing, right? Right. That sort of thing you might think of is um, with a little bit of luck. Yeah, and then estuaries kind of in the middle there. You know, it's that more modern London sound. Yeah. Okay. Since you mentioned Cockney, I remember there was an argument about whether uh, the guy called Gecko was Cockney or was Australian. Yeah. I always thought he was Australian. I assumed he was, but apparently... According no, to you. I mean, there's a ton of similarities between the two because, in fact, that's one of the things I oftentimes have to work with people on if they're shooting for one or the other to nail those. But there's a difference. Like a lot of the sounds are, are the same, but a couple of the big differences are um, placement, which is the sense of where the sound lives in the mouth or the oral posture or a lot of different words to describe that. And then the other thing is the intonation or like the musicality. So like Cockney is very punchy, whereas Australian okay. is a little more slight. So if you go like a little bit more like this with Cockney, and then the Australian's got a little bit more of like a press or a, like a drag to it. And it tends to go a little bit along this line. You can maybe like if I try to go way too far with it, can you hear that kind of dip I'm doing? Yeah. So that's an intonation difference. Yeah. So, and then the, yeah, go ahead. So which one is the Geico Gecko? <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's more Cockney-esque. Yeah. He's, it's a British. Yeah. So what happened? I mean, like, so he grew up in Britain and then, so how did the Gecko get all the way? Did he jump on a ship and well, end up in Australia he, or? If you do something like this, you know, what he's doing is a little bit more like this. And so it's a it's Cockney-esque, but it, it's on the verge of being estuary, the things he's doing. Whereas if you took that, like the Geico, like the Geico Gecko, and you did it a little bit more along this line, that would be a little bit more Australian. But can you hear how similar those are? They are similar. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. The, so the, the placement is also different in that, when you're doing Cockney, you have to find all this space in the back, like this sort of space in the back, whereas the Australian tends to have a little bit more of a flattened space in the back. And it can feel like wider and flatter to people, whereas the Cockney feels more sort of lifted and rounded. Um, and the thing you got to be careful, I would say, with both of those, but especially with Cockney, is to not default to like like going sort of mumbly mode, you know, where you just do this sort of thing and then you don't quite know what you're doing. Hmm. And that tends to land you in the land between Cockney and Australian. Uh-oh. Yeah. Like some kind of no man's land. Yeah. And so, then, okay. So South South historically, like those two. and then historically, I'm assuming that Australian is Cockney people who landed in Australia and then it began to evolve. Is that true? That's at least uh, that's at least a significant part of it. Yeah. I mean, like I said, accents change over time, right? I talked about uh, how RP has changed just in the 20th into the 21st century. Okay. But like, so if you ever watch anything, I'm trying to remember what it was called, Turn. There was a series that was called Turn that was about um, like the Revolutionary War. Okay. Uh, the American Revolution, right? And they would always portray like the British officers with something along this line. Well, that accent wasn't really prevalent in England until the very late 1700s is when it really started to arise. And what tended to be around London prior to that was something where actually the R's were on. So like instead of dropping the R's, that's called a non-rhotic accent. Okay. Um, so like this is dropping the R's, but this is putting those R's on. The R is here. The R is gone. Can you hear that? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So non-rhotic, rhotic basically means R-ish, right? It's kind of R-ish. Okay. So when it's non-rhotic, it means the R's after the vowels are dropped. And when it's rhotic, it means the R's are there. Okay. Well, most British accents used to be rhotic. And now hardly any of them are. The About the only one that's still, well, and even this one's changing, was like the West Country, which is Hagrid from Harry Potter. Right then, Harry, that sort of, like where those R's are on the word like that. Those R's, that's like the classic Devon, Bristol, Cornwall, what's called West Country. It's kind of the southwest of England. Yeah. Okay. Now I got a question for you. So, yeah. and, and how did you learn all this stuff? Like, did you, were you like a linguist major when you were in college or something? Or how did you uh, get all this? For acting. I went to school for acting. Um, okay. Yeah, I got an MFA in acting. And then... From what school? Well, uh, University of Nebraska, which no longer has a graduate program. I must have broken it. The University you know? of Nebraska. So, now, there's not too many famous Hollywood actors that come out of Nebraska. There's not a ton of them. Um, it's like I went to Juilliard. Yeah. No, <laughs> I went to Nebraska. Okay. That's where I met my wife. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And okay. while I was there, they were like, you should teach a voice class. And so I taught a speaking voice class, not singing voice. Okay. And then when my wife and I moved to Chicago, um, I found out, well, I got a teaching gig before we moved there and uh, just a one semester replacement for somebody. And I went, actually, I'm kind of enjoying this teaching thing, which I thought I didn't want to do. Okay. And then we moved to Chicago and I continued to train in voice work and then eventually started teaching that. Okay. And then we ended up in Houston. Uh, Because my job in Chicago was ending and did a search and the best offer I got was University of Houston. And we ended up moving here temporarily 20 years ago. Yeah. And yet you never required a Texas accent. No. I mean, I can, you know, put it on a little bit lightly and feel pretty comfortable with that. And I can very comfortably say y'all now. Y'all. Not as good at saying all y'all. Like so all you know, y'all, all y'all got to just sit down and shut up. Do you know that distinction? All y'all. Oh, it sounds kind of redundant y'all? to me. Y'all, <laughs> all y'all. Of it That's like, I'm fixing to try that. Yeah, I'm fixing. Look, all y'all, I'm fixing to get you all to sit down and to shut up. All right. Yep. Yep. You know what so I'm like saying? two people can be y'all. And in okay. fact, a group of like 300 could be y'all. But also anything that's like three or more people could be all y'all. Yeah, so all y'all. A larger group, it can be all y'all. That's yeah. like a whole nother. You know, that's a whole nother thing. Yeah. <laughs> One of those words that grammarians like they tear their hair out every time they hear you say it. <laughs> all right. So and I love it. I grew up in the land of you guys. And you I'm got, like, guys. Yeah. You guys, well, you guys, well, come on. Okay. Right. Or the other one that I love is in Pittsburgh is yins. Yins. I haven't even known that. I didn't know that one. They tend to spell it Y-I-N-Z. And it comes from Ewans. Ewans. Yeah. Yins. And what they tend to say is they tend to say the yins guys. Instead of yins, they tend to, but they sometimes they call them yinzers. People from there are yinzers. Wow. But, I never knew that. Yeah, Yin's guys, Yin's guys. Now, for some reason, that apparently I don't know that because you never, it's not in Hollywood. Like you don't hear actors saying that. No, I mean, that one's much more isolated, whereas y'all yeah. is over a huge part of the country. Y'all, we, I mean, lots of us know y'all. Yeah. I mean, I got a friend at work who says y'all. Yeah. Y'all kind of just word, chill out. Man. I love y'all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Y'all is awesome. Well, actually, I mean, then you have a plural version of you and a singular version of you, like most languages have. Yeah, because it's a big pain, in, it's a big pain in the butt that we just have the singular you, which is where the whole me growing up saying you guys and so many other people in the U.S. saying right. you guys is that it's it's. I will say that to a group of my wife will say it to a group of only women. She will say you guys, you guys, yeah, same and it's, thing, you know, yeah. Yeah, you're, yeah. Well, okay, well, I'm not even going to go into that subject. 
<laughs> um, so we'll just let that one ride. Um, so, so then now, but it seems so, it, so you're mostly self-taught then apparently as far as all this stuff goes. Well, no, cause I, I definitely had some, I mean, it's like, well, when I was in grad school, I learned phonetics, okay. but it was crappy phonetics. It was okay. really, um, so phonetics are these symbols that represent all the different sounds, right? Mm. And linguists use it. Right. And what happened is over the course of many years of all these linguists getting together, they started to create agreements about, let's try to use the same symbols, everybody. Right. Yeah. So they came up with the international phonetic alphabet. Okay. But then there's, there's a broad transcription and there's also narrow transcription. Right. And so broad transcription is, it's basically this sound. And a narrow transcription is an attempt to say, no, it's this. Exactly sound. this. Yeah, it's exactly this sound. But even that's a little bit arbitrary because different people will interpret it just a little bit differently. Which is you a know? nice segue into the diagram right behind your head. Uh, <laughs> the annoying, the frightening yeah. diagram. Yeah. 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 And you know what? When I'm, when I'm teaching... I mean, with my university students, I'll dive a little bit deeper into this. But like when I'm teaching that accents class, I don't do a super deep dive into phonetics because I don't I don't think that actors have to know phonetics to learn accents. OK, I think dialect coaches need it because we need okay. to understand it on a deeper level to be able to lead people through it and be able to teach it. OK, See, um, I know a little bit about are, this because principles that are important when I went to the UW. University of Washington back in the 90s. Actually, did anybody eight. of any use go there? <laughs> yeah, like did did anybody back did at they, you for your Nebraska, your Nebraska jibe? There. Well, now I'm gonna counter that with a biblical quote. Um, did anything good ever come out of Nazareth? <laughs> <laughs> Which, so I think anyway, when you went to UW, <laughs> yeah, did you so, do anything useful? Yeah, well. I did actually get a music degree, but before that I decided I needed, because I was into yoga and meditation, I needed to fully understand Sanskrit. So I, I took three quarters of Sanskrit, turned out my Sanskrit teacher was a big time linguist. So he threw a lot of linguistic stuff at us too. That's why when I started hearing you talking about all this stuff, I'm thinking this is all linguistics, right? Yeah. So now, so my question now is, and then, okay. So in the Sanskrit language, we have the, the alphabet that's used is called Devanagari, which, which literally means the, 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 le the letters of the gods. And then in, within Devanagari, um, there's a one-to-one -one correlation to each syllable, what every syllable is spelled. Like in, in Sanskrit, if you know how to spell a word, you know exactly how to pronounce it. There's no alternate spellings. And there's never it any. Is, it is phonemic, right? And like, like for example, in Sanskrit, when you want a k sound, it's a, a k. It's not a sometimes a k, sometimes a c, sometimes whatever, like it is in English. So every single syllable is spelled in Sanskrit, and it's a one-to-one -one correlation. And then again, they also have a system of transliteration, where if you can't read the fancy Devanagari. You can look at Roman letters, and then there's some versions of transliteration that are only approximate, which are. But then there's a couple other ones that use diacritical marks, where if you use that system, you'll get a, again an exact correlation to the actual sounds, which is the same thing with your phonetic thing you were telling us about, right? Yeah, yeah. So I know a little bit about it, at least from that perspective, and so so I'm interested in hearing. Um, a little bit about what what you've picked up through linguistics, because I mean the business. How you were talking about how, for example, how sound how dialects shift over time. Linguistics is all about how languages shift, you know, and pronunciations shift over time. And actually, linguists will say if you want to really understand the history of a culture, study their language. And how it evolves and then you'll find out you can tell from their language like who came and conquered who intermarried who who migrated in and out and all that stuff you can there all those hints 
are available in their language. Yeah. It's kind of stuff he would talk about. So I found that super fascinating. Yeah. So absolutely. So I'm guessing that you've and you've, I I I speak I only speak English and some Spanish. Okay. So I'm not I am not a linguist by any stretch of the imagination. I okay. I simply steal certain linguistic elements to ah. make use of them. Okay. There's, you know, there is a there is a linguist who's had a big impact on the way that um, phonetics get taught, certainly within um, within the theater world, and it's this guy by the name of J. C. Wells. Okay. So John Wells, and um, he wrote a a series of three books that are uh, dialects of English. Okay. And his first book. He lays out this, um, he's laying, he's trying to be able to talk about phonetics and sounds and how they change from, or are different, I should say, from one accent to another. Mm -hmm. And so he, he ended up creating this, um, a lexical set of words where he came up with like, okay, let's talk about the fleece vowel for the, what most of us would say as something like the E sound mm -hmm. versus the kit vowel, the I sound. Yeah, right. Yeah. So he came up with all these lexical words and then he would have lists of words that go with that because the basic idea is like in this language, what happens with fleece probably happens with almost all the other words that are like fleece. Okay. So is that the list you show me, me when we were working on my me. Brooklyn accent? That, yeah, absolutely. Like, fa father, you know, my father said this. My father, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so, like, you're bringing up father, so you're kind of getting into what I like to call hell's corner, right? Which is right. And we talked a little bit about that. That's in this. This is the vowel quadrilateral, basically the mouth, and this is the top of the mouth and the bottom, and the front of the mouth and the back of the mouth. Well, in the back. There's these three vowel symbols that really commonly get used, but there can be other sounds that occur as well. And there are four words that are really helpful to know what happens with words like those, because they say so much about what's going on with an accent. And so the, the words that J.C. Wells came up with, I changed one of them because the first one he, he calls the palm vowel, P-A-L-M. Mm -hmm. But most Americans don't say palm, they say palm. Palm. In the palm. Well, I say in the palm of my hand, of your hand, the palm of your you're hand. You're going closer to the palm, the, to the palm mm -hmm. but I, I think you're even rounding it a little bit. The palm. Palm. The palm. Kind of like pond. I, pond. I, I, I dipped my palm, uh, I dipped the is palm the of my same, hand in the pond. Is it the same vowel for you if you say, this word versus saying what a pomegranate is well let's see there's the palm of my hand and there's a pomegranate well not quite i guess i do kind of alm it so pomegranate just a little bit yeah so the word i like to use is father, father instead of palm because americans have so many i grew up saying palm so i'm palm. further away from it than you are even. right yeah and it's because of the, my iowa l's palm all palm, palm. Palm. Yeah. So there's what I like to call father instead of palm, right? Father okay. and lot, lot and then cloth and thought. Thought. Well, like my father thought that, uh, you know, I did, well, so he no, just said back, that. Yeah. Come back to your accent. Do me a so, favor and say those words <laughs> father and lot and cloth and thought. Okay. Well, I thought about my father a lot and then I was a. Uh, I got sad as I had to wipe my tears with a cloth. Okay. So you're doing what most Americans do, where you split those four words into two different subdivisions. You tend to say father, lot, cloth, thought. Thought, cloth, oh, father, oh, lot. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. So a little bit of rounding on cloth and thought. Yeah. Right. And that's what I do. Father, lot, claw, uh, uh, thought. It's not a significant difference, but it's a little bit of a difference. Um, okay. When you get to New Yorkers, it tends to be a really big difference. Father, lot, cloth. 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 
Uh oh. So when I was trying to do my Brooklyn, I went my father. Yeah, you're starting to over round it a little bit. Open it up a little more. Say my father. My father. Yeah. And now say the word L O T. A lot. My father talked to me a lot when I was a kid. You know what I'm saying? But now say the word cloth and thought with that accent. Well, like, uh, I mean, so I had to grab a cloth, you know, because I, I, I thought I was going to start to cry. And both of those, you need to round them more. I, I grabbed the cloth. cloth. I grabbed the cloth because of, I thought I was going to start to cry. And if anything, you need to round them more. So, so, so it, it's almost going to feel like you make it a diphthong where it almost goes. If you stress the word, it can almost feel like you're saying cloth. All right, so I, I I thought that I was gonna cry, so I so I grabbed a cloth, right? Yeah, from who? Say well, the from, word for dad. From my father. Who do you think? There you go. Yeah. yeah, that's the distinction. You get that? So that mild division that both you and I have, father, lot, cloth, thought, that slight difference that we have for New Yorkers tends to be significant. All right. Father and lot are pretty close, right? They may have a little bit of rounding to them, but it's more about, here, I'm going to come back to this now, placement, sense of where the sound lives in the mouth. There tends to be, especially if we're looking at kind of the stereotypical Italian or Brooklyn, okay. yo, that's sort of Brooklyn Italian kind of thing, right? Yo. There may be a little bit of a rounding to it, father, lot, right? As opposed to father, lot, father, lot, just a hint of rounding to it, largely because of placement opening up the back, like what I mentioned with Cockney. Right. And so this, what you're talking about Here's replacement to... is it's like, just like when, when you take voice lessons, you learn how to sing, you learn how to get the sound to resonate in different parts of your sinuses and your nose or the back of your throat, all these different places in your head and your neck, you can cause it to resonate in different places and you get a very different sound. Yeah. And that's the same thing that you're talking about when you say placement, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. most of the time when you're doing something like getting resonance into your face, right? Mm -hmm. Mostly that's BS. Almost uh, all, because almost all of the resonance that is really in your voice is about opening the channel where the sound is. Because hmm, I thought, so sound I mean, like, at your vocal. like I've heard, I have a teacher that got me to open up, like to flare my nose and get the sound to really growl right there in my nose. And I could feel it happening right in there in the nasal cavity. So you're saying that's not true? That's mostly BS. Really? Yeah. Now, that said, I don't give a damn if it's scientifically inaccurate as long as it results in what you're after. So what's creating okay? that snarl sound then? So Now, the snarl is probably helping you to shape what's going on in your mouth space. Okay. So it's like the now, soft palate or something. Said, there may be a little bit with regards to like your sinuses, right? You've got these right. varied sinuses. There may be a little bit of that in the voice. The main thing is what are you doing for shaping the space? Like, so chest resonance, right? Right. Yeah. Chest. Yeah. I know. Chest that resonance is. in reality is throat resonance. Oh. Well, really? I mean, chest is below where the sound gets created. The sound gets created at the vocal folds, but we call right. it chest resonance because that's where we feel it. Okay, right. And singers yeah. know all no, about this. There may be a hint yeah. of chest resonance in your voice because of the rumbling that can happen there may reinforce the vibrations that are getting created. So okay, so hold on. So if I just do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, that's chest. But if I went, do, do, like maybe I, I might not be able to do it. Do, 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 re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, that's way up here. Now, you might be flipping into falsetto, it sounds like there. Right. Well, I'm trying to yeah. mess falsetto, up, is but, a, falsetto yeah. is a different beast. That's where your vocal folds literally shift their plane that they're on. Okay. Um, and that's what, for women, is commonly called head voice. Well, men have a head voice. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's, that's like if you sing Bach and you're a tenor, most of the time you're not going to go up in your chest. You're going to go into your head. You're you going to go into your falsetto, probably. Well, it's not really falsetto. It's more like a, a head. It's a head. It's a light tenor voice. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like, it depends on. So 
there are there are various things that can because so now we're getting into voice land right yeah yeah there are various things that can change and they, there really are big relationships between accents and voice okay so it's uh, you know we're not we're not um totally shifting topics here okay um part of what's going there's so many variables when you get into a voice mm -hmm. some of it is about um <clears throat> like the the and we're starting to get to the edge of what i know okay. yeah because i don't teach singing okay but one of the things that can happen is your vocal folds literally change plane right you can also have to actually tilt some of the cartilage that's in your throat that has an effect on the sound of your voice uh, what why, why sometimes um, they have you go like this and that There's may a lot be of tricks, yeah. cartilage, or it may just be one of those tricks that's getting you to shape your space differently. Right. There's also about what is the space that it's bouncing through? Are you opening up more of the back, which tends to bring out the chest res? Right. Are you reducing that? That tends to have an effect on a different part. Also, like what a lot of people think of as nasal. So right now, can you hear how nasal I am right oh, now? Oh, yeah, I can hear that. Great. I am not nasal. Really? Because I can feel it like right there in my nose resonating Wait. right there. But do me a favor and say right there. Say that with that nasality. Like right there. Right there. Right now do there. me a favor. Don't don't close your throat up. When oh, you right do it. there. Okay. It's like right there. Right say in my right nose. There. Right there. Right there. It's, I can feel it tickling Good. my nose Now do nose me a favor. Hairs. Just say right there. <laughs> say that. Right there. Now, plug your nose and say it again. Right there. Now, plug and unplug it. Right, right there. there. Right there. Right there. So hang on, Matt. Plug and unplug as you say it. Right there. Right there. Right now, when you're plugging there. and unplugging, when you're plugging and unplugging, is your voice changing? Well, not a whole lot. Great. <laughs> Probably not. I didn't hear it changing. So here's the deal. You were not being nasal. Mm. You're, you were using what I'm going to use. I'm going to use the term twang. Okay. Okay. So there's a singing teacher that I like a lot of the work that she's done. She's now passed, but it's Joe Estel. Okay. Um, and I studied with her when she was alive back in the early 2000s, not extensively, but um, she was using some terms that I was like, these are awesome terms. I'm going to steal these for some things I was already talking about. In addition to other things that I, I really did learn from her and from her teachers, she has amazing people who've, who've done her work. Well, the term she uses that I think is really useful is twang. Twang. So yep. when I go right like this, yep. oh yeah, oh yeah. When I'm plugging and unplugging and the sound doesn't change, it's not actually nasal. It's twang. I'm going to use the word twang to describe this, okay. right? It's kind but of a I double reed it, sound. If in I make it both, yeah, it's very reedy. Yeah. Yeah. Like very an twang, oboe. Very treble. It's very mm -hmm. mask resonant, right? Right. That is most of that is probably being created actually back just above the vocal folds at at the <laughs> airy epiglottic sphincter. Uh oh. So we're going down a rabbit hole here. So okay. when you so put your hand on your throat and swallow. Put it right on the <laughs> middle of your, right across like you're going to choke yourself. No. And then go ahead and choke yourself, Matt. Uh, it, uh, do me a favor. Uh, oh, 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 stop, with, with your hand there just right. before you die, swallow. Okay. I think did I felt something. Did you feel your Adam's apple go up? I sort of did. Mm. I hope it did because otherwise, part of what's going I on felt something. Adam's apple didn't go up, part of why you may be dying. <laughs> is that your saliva might have gone down into the tube into your lungs. That's not good. Have you ever, you've drunk <laughs> something and then started coughing because it went down the wrong tube, right? I certainly did. I don't know why God created us like that. I mean, I think maybe you messed up. It's but... a little inefficient engineering. It seems. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's efficient because we, we can do it. We just keep screwing it up. Yeah. Maybe it shouldn't have been the idiots. Yeah. Why can't we just put it the food was, directly in our body. stomach? Uh, yeah. Bingo. Well, because I want it in my mouth first. <laughs> yeah. So 
those two tubes, the front tube is the one that goes to your lungs and the back one is the one that goes down to your gut, right? Okay. So when you're drinking something and it goes down the wrong pipe, it goes through the front pipe towards your lungs and then you autonomic response to kick the lip <laughs> or whatever out. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what the reason that most of the time it doesn't go there, but instead it goes down where it should down to your belly is the areopaglottic sphincter. Okay. So if this is your larynx, here's mm. our test with a little LaCroix, a little LaCroix. When no, you not LaCroix. I don't, I'm not going to let that go. It is LaCroix. No, it's not. It's LaCroix. Uh, even, uh, where, uh, where is, now, where is that manufactured? Uh, LaCroix is a word that was manufactured in France. It means the cross. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, if they're going to use a French word, they're gonna, they should pronounce it in a French manner. Oh, okay. seriously, this is where you're going to go. <laughs> I took you French looked... class. There's no way in hell I'm ever going to say LaCroix. No matter. I don't care if the CEO okay. comes out and bangs on my door and says it's LaCroix. I'm going to say, I'm sorry. It's you're wrong. It's LaCroix. And just so you know, <laughs> it's not LaCroix. It's LaCroix. That's completely just, wrong. Just... That is so wrong. It's a Le is in France, le is masculine, la is feminine. This is la, la it's, croix. And just so you know, it's LaCroix, but whatever. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it, it is, don't, okay, I'm not gonna let my wife watch this video because I, I always get mad at her when she calls it le, le croix. And I'm saying, hun, it's la croix. La croix. And it's not craw, okay. it's no La croix. I'll let, I'll let it go, Mott. Okay. okay. So anyway, Mott. Yeah. Um, Mathieu. You don't mind if I call you Mott. Do you? Well, since we're in French land, you may call me Mathieu Leblanc. I mean, Mathieu de Blanc. Mathieu. We oui, Mathieu. Mathieu. Yeah, so, oui, Monsieur. Where the hell were we? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's going on in your throat, right? Yeah. So you've got this thing, your epiglottis. Okay. It's kind of like a trash can lid. Okay. Because okay. there's a muscle that, that connects it with basically your larynx. Okay. And when that mu muscle closes, it brings your epiglottis down onto it. And usually your larynx goes up at the same time and okay. it closes it when you're swallowing so that the, your lacquer goes down the right pipe. Right. Isn't that how it's pronounced? Lacquer. Your Look, I'd rather have you have you call it lacquer than lac your than Lacroix. Lacroix. Your Lacroix. Your Lacroix goes down the right pipe, right? Yeah, so, Lacroix. So it closes up in this way, and the the muscle that's doing that is the AES, the airy epiglottic sphincter. It's a sphincter muscle because it closes like this, and when it partially closes, that's a big part of what you're doing when you go twangy. If it were nasal, your sound would change. Uh, okay. Changing, that's nasal. It okay. And nasally, you can also do just twang and you can do just nasal. Uh, so that's uh, not so twangy and it's more nasal, pure nasal. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's very, it's extremely interesting. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the thing about all this stuff that it's kind of what makes the human voice so amazing is like, yeah, all the different sounds and vowels and all these different the thing that's really wild that really blows my mind is how well we can perceive like just a change in a placement of a vowel. The way our ear hears it, it's like this drastic difference, but it's just yeah. like you just took a little bit of the highs out of it or something. Yeah, I mean didn't really do that much to the sound, but it ends up being yeah. perceived so differently, you know? Yeah, I, I, I love how you can hit the same pitch. Uh, uh, and it, right. sounds like, it sounds like the second one's way lower. It's I know, the same pitch. it sounds an octave lower. You think it's an octave lower, but it's the same. It's like you when I play a little, note on the cello on the, the A same. string, I play the same note on my violin on the G string, yeah. And it's the same exact note, but they but sound very different. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. So, okay. Um, oh, oh, I was going to mention, so, but you also are a Shakespearean actor, right? Yeah. A and you do Shakespeare, you produce Shakespeare plays and you act in Europe, right? Yeah. My, like my wife Prague and I or somewhere? teach, yeah, we teach each summer with the Prague Shakespeare Company. Which is why uh, I wore this shirt. Oh, <laughs> yeah, my very cousin. Nice. <laughs> that is great. Yes, yeah. and and you could wear that to Prague so that people would go, huh? Eh. <laughs> American. <laughs> I got it in Frankenmuth. I got it in Michigan. Frankenmuth is a Bavarian oh. town in Michigan that my, my dad grew up in, where nice. most people in Frankenmuth speak German as well as English. Oh, wow. So, Still to this day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. That's awesome. So anyways, I needed to do that tangent just to explain the shirt, but now we can go back to. <laughs> we that's all right. I love Prague, but I've also, it's given us a chance to spend some time in Germany too. That's great. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. So yeah, we started something like five or six years ago teaching um, outside of this time of the plague to teach um, Shakespeare with the Prague Shakespeare Company um, and uh, the wonderful folks there. And there's teachers who come from mostly the US but other places as well, from England, from, uh, from India, from, so from all over the place. And students, again, mostly from the US but there are students from India and China and England and Berlin and you know, all over the place uh, who That's come there. Cool. It's, it's so really great. And we, so we teach, we do classes and then we okay. also uh, do productions where I'm right. not producing it. Oh, I thought you were directing it or something like that. Well, I'll be directing. Yeah. Okay. But I, so the producer is the one who's got to handle all the office kind of stuff, okay. right? All the legal stuff. And then the director will, will, is the one who makes this show happen. But in the end, the director does what the producer wants. You know, okay. So yeah. um, the Prague Shakespeare Company produces it, and then a bunch of us do directing. And so, like um, this summer, my wife and I will co-direct uh, and also be in uh, Much Ado About Nothing. That'll be interesting. We've never both been in a show and directed it. Um, and then we'll also be in um, Hamlet as well. Are you playing uh, we Hamlet? Don't have to direct. I'm playing Hamlet's stepdad hmm. and she's playing his mom. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when you do this Shakespeare play, are you going to put on a fake British accent or what kind of accent are you going to use for your character? I, well, number one, I don't know yet what accent. Well, actually, let me go back. Number one, no, I'm not going to put on a British accent when I do it. Okay. Unless conceptually it takes place in England. Okay. okay, so this kind of harkens back to what I was talking about earlier with accents changing over time. Okay. So one thing that we've taught there, and we did this with um, uh, one year, David Crystal, who's another linguist, uh, he came to join the faculty there. And he's a linguist who um, popularized a term, original pronunciation. Okay. And what he means by that is theoretically the way that Shakespeare's um, text would have been spoken during the time of Shakespeare. Okay. And it's actually way closer to Hagrid than it is to Captain Picard. I've heard this. I've heard some, I've heard some of this on the radio once. It's really yeah. Could you do a couple of, yeah. Could you pull out a couple of lines of Shakespeare in the original? It's probably something much closer to, shall I compare the summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Summer's day, day. Sorry, I, fine, I haven't done that one for a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So it is, it is a, it's different than what a lot of people would, ex, would expect. It's got like a harder R sound, right? It's a rhotic mm -hmm. accent. That's almost all British accents were that up through like the middle of the 1700s. And that's why having all these British officers speak with this sort of RP, which really didn't arise until right at the end of the 1700s. Right. And even then it wasn't spread enough that that many people would use it. Right. 
it's inaccurate, but it's what people expect. So some right. I remember when you but what you talked expect? about this in a different video, where like like when you're when you're training an actor to have a certain dialect, you have to you have to think what is the audience expecting, and so like if you do something that's historically accurate, it might just sound so weird to the audience that it backfires. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Well, there's there's also like there's a play. Um, uh, Our country's good. It's a lovely, lovely play. And there's a num- number of different British accents. And one of those characters is fr- is West Country. And so it's very possible that when you do a production of that, somebody might hear this person with a West Country accent. And they would think, oh, she's terrible at a British accent because it's not necessarily what they would expect. Yeah. All these yes, things. So sometimes you do have to definitely consider like audience expectation. Right. And, and also what, what the audience's ears can handle. Because right. like an Irish accent in an Irish film that is only going to be shown in Ireland can be much more specific and strong than an Irish movie with Irish accents that's going to be seen throughout the world. You tend to have to go lighter with the accents because you need more people to be able to understand it. Right. Yeah. So um, would you say, like, I was thinking about this, how when I found out that you're actually quite a trained actor and you are an actor, especially Shakespearean one. um, Now you haven't seen me act, so you don't know how well trained I am. Well, you've demonstrated stuff in our, but you're not trained. But I mean, you've shown me a lot of stuff in our one on one classes and because, OK, so me and Jim do Zoom classes about once a week and um, it started out as an accents class, but then it evolved into an acting class. So right now we mostly do acting. Um, so, I mean, as far as I can tell, you have a lot of background in that. Now, I realized, OK, as an accent dialect coach, being also having a lot of acting chops is useful right because you're able to put it in the context of basically when somebody learns an accent like what are you learning this for either you're going to be an actor or you're going to do like audiobooks or something i I want to say that that person hopefully is an actor as well yeah you do the best work if they are actors yeah like most people don't pay all this money for your class just for the hell of it right so they're like It's it's yeah, it's they're developing a skill that they're going to be using in their career, you know. Yeah. So. So yeah. anyways, I mean, would you say most dialect coaches have that kind of background as well? Or do you think that that's kind of unique for you? No, I think most most of them do. Yeah. OK. And then I do think that it helps a lot the more that they really do understand the acting process, because. um Well, and another thing, here's, here's one thing I'll also say is that uh, one of the things I do through my website is I have an, op- uh, uh, an option for people to have me record their script for them in the accent, Oh, right? Um, and so I'll, uh, like I did a couple of them this afternoon where I had to do, you know, the whole role for this person in this musical, like reading oh. all of their lines for them in the accent. Once in a while, somebody will say, but can you do it without with no acting, with no intention. And I'm like, no, I can't. Yeah. Because it affects how you say it. Right. And also part of what I need to, what I need to know from people who want me to do it is I'm like, what is the, you know, what is the, what kind of character is this? What, are the, what is the tone of this? Cause that'll affect what I bring to it. And that's me right. not like tell them exactly how to act it but I have to have some information. You can't do it. Totally. Right. I remember cause you were, you were, I remember you were there's in one of your videos, you're saying, you know, like you have to have some access to a certain accent. Like there's a certain gesture or certain thought, certain thought you do when you're like, you're going to start talking like this, you know, like uh, I just can't do it. I have to kind of become that kind of a person. You know what I'm saying? So it I have changed, to conjure it, it up. Change the personality. Okay, so yeah. so you speak some Sanskrit. Do you speak other languages? Some French? I do. Yeah, je parle français un peu. Bien sûr. Did you notice how your whole tone changed when you switched into? 
that's what's so fun about foreign languages is when I start speaking in a different language, it immediately launches me into like a totally different personality, even like my whole thought process completely shifts. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. There's a um, if you've never read it, it's well, there's a there is lots of debate about. Um, so there's a book that I love. It's Martin Heidegger's On the Way to Language. It's a it's a book I read in my like intro to philosophy class back in college, and it kind of okay. blew up my mind. <laughs> and it's this sense that people um, like people experience the world differently if they speak another language. And I agree completely. And it's, it's I think it's partially true and maybe more true than that. There are some studies that show that it's not necessarily true, but there's also, I don't know. I, well, I have trouble buying that it's, that there's no truth. The thing is whatsoever. what I experienced, do, it's like, I mean, the entire, it's almost like the entire, the, all this information of the entire culture is immediately conjured up through the language. Yeah. You know, it's almost like you just conjured up a whole, like a spirit or something. Yeah. You know, I think so too. And, and that same thing needs to happen with accent and dialect work. You've got to trans, you have to transform to be able to be from New York, to be able to be from Boston, to be able to be from London. You have to transform your behavior. And there are cultural elements you know, sometimes once in a while, I'll say something like, OK, go back, be more French and do that again. And it'll yeah. it will <clears throat> have an impact when people realize, no, wait a minute, you need to you need to buy into transformation. Yeah, yeah. it's a necessity, I think. I find it ex super exciting. It's also really liberating. It's like a way to get out of yourself and suddenly become. Yeah. this other person for a few moments you know yeah. yeah but then one of the challenges generally speak you have to it, i like to is it's not about you transforming like this me and i have to transform into you know new york me mm -hmm. instead i like to think of it <laughs> as, as so this is me, and what I have to do is expand my sense of self to encompass how am I when I am New York? Yeah, this is what I'm... Sense? Well, this is what you and I are struggling with in the acting classes we're having right now. Yeah. I like to just shift into these total other characters, and then what I keep getting, not just from you, but from other acting teachers, is, well, that's fake. It's not authentic. I don't believe you. Yeah. You. Yeah. 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 And it's, I mean, one of the things you've got to do, I, I, and this is my take on it, right? You can take everything with a grain of salt is you got to bring yourself along because you're all you got. It's sort of like what they say to writers, write what you know, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there is, you know, there is no, so in Hamlet coming up this summer, right? There okay. is no Claudius. There is no Gertrude. They do not exist. These are characters on a page. And I, I like to think of it. I can't remember if I've used this with you already. It's, it makes me think of Jurassic Park, where they're like, we take the DNA from a Tyrannosaurus Rex and we fill it in with a frog's DNA, where we're missing little sections of it. And I think that that's I, what I have to do is take some of the DNA from Claudius. What are these givens with Claudius? That, that become a part of Jim and Jim transforming, not to become less Jim, but actually to just bring out elements of Jim that maybe I'm not as consciously aware of and don't bring out on a regular basis that are elements that are more Claudius-esque. But, mm -hmm. but Hamlet does not exist. It's crap that's written on a piece of paper, right? Yeah. And this actor who is cast as Hamlet has to bring out their whoeverness, right? And right. say the words that were given to them. So they got to justify those words. They do need to come to meet it, but they, the, I think too often people think that they should abandon who they are and transform and become this other thing. And it's like, 
that that I find that usually leads people the wrong direction. Yeah. yeah. So I'm well, like, I need more mat. I need more you full mat, right? But I'm bored with Matt. The whole reason I'm being an actor is so I cannot be Matt for a little while. <laughs> this is, I, that's the problem. Do me a I favor. don't Become believe it. Matt. Matt. Well, I can, I can be Matt. Uh, fire all the be photon Matt. torpedoes. Why don't you drink your LaCroix, Matt? It's, it's La Croix, monsieur. But La Matt Croix. Say LaCroix. La Do me a favor. Can you say LaCroix? I can't. My my tongue will like burst into flames. And that is why <laughs> you will never be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll he show you. you. He can't They'll be sorry when I'm an actor. They'll be sorry. <laughs> you know, and that's one of the that's actually one of those crazy things with acting as opposed to your cello right yeah you can't go oh well i can play cello <laughs> it's really evident that you can't play cello All right, let me let me put it this way it's very evident that i can't play cello right okay but, i'll agree to that but anybody can oh i can act and if words can come out of your mouth which most of us do on a pretty regular basis people can go oh you're an actor i i really i was on a, a movie set once it was yeah. a long day, a really long shoot. And some tech guy, I don't remember, I don't remember what, what his thing was, but he was, we were all just tired as hell. And we're sitting down eating a little something. And he goes, so what do you gotta, what do you gotta do to be a dialect coach? And, and, it, and I was like, well, I thought about it for a moment. And I went, you gotta tell people that you're a dialect coach and they have to believe you. <laughs> Oh, okay. And that really is what it takes. Be an actor. <laughs> well, Marlon Same Brando thing. said things like that. I remember when he was younger, like in his younger days in the 60s, he would do interviews on TV a lot, at least the ones I've seen on YouTube. And he talked about acting. He like he, everybody was praising him for being the greatest actor on the planet. And he's like, well, it's just natural. I mean, even a child can act. Acting is just what a, what a human being does. What's the big deal? He would say stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And it's because he took he was taking for granted all of the things that led him to where he was at that point. You know. I mean, a lot of times actor training becomes about untraining people because they've developed bad habits. Mm. You know? And I think that's that's part of what we're struggling with sometimes is going, dude, stop acting so hard. Right? Right. Say the line. Respond to me. I'm going to say this to you. Respond to me. Respond to me in this moment. And then it's like, good. We got to get all that baggage off of there that is not what you want to take on the plane with you. Right? Now, once, once we get you to just deal with your carry-ons, <laughs> then we can start talking about what baggage is useful for you to bring on this flight. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. All right. Well, here, this is the time in the interview where I say, well, we've been talking for an hour. <laughs> how far, how much longer do we want to go now? So like, do, um, does there's anything special you want to hit before we wrap it up? Um, we I actually really didn't talk about that chart that much. I don't know if you wanted to get into that. Nah, that's mm -hmm. okay. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be talked about a lot. I mean, it's a few, okay. I'll bring it out and I use it even when I'm coaching little kids and things. I'll sometimes bring it out and I'll go, hey, just so you know, this sound is this and this, just to explain a concept. And it's not that people need to know the symbols, but they just need to get it conceptually. So that All right, I got it. Now, kid, yeah. <laughs> what I want you to do right now, I want you to start talking in those seven different voices you mentioned. And if you mess up, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to like uh, put this thing up to 10 and I'm going to pull the trigger and there ain't going to be nothing left. So better do a good job. All right. So let's hear that uh, British one again. The ones that I'll be teaching. Is that right? This yeah. Group. Yeah. So we go standard British RP and then we cockney. We do something along this line, right? Can class mm -hmm. in London. 
And then we go to Estuary, which is kind of in that land in the middle. And then what do we do next? Oh, we go to we go to New York, Brooklyn-esque, sort of Italian Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. And then we go to Northern Ireland, where we work on a Northern Irish accent. And then we go from oh. Northern Ireland, we go to French, right? We work on a French accent. Okay, let's and hear then- your French accent, because I took a French in high school, so I can tell if it's yeah. worth a shit or not. I was I was trying to do a French accent. I was trying to do a French accent, but clearly it's not working, right? Well, okay. So then the French, and then after the French, then we do more the Spain, the Castilian Spanish. Oop. We go through this, those accents. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's what we do. And then with each one, I'm trying to make points. Like when you do the Castilian Spanish, we work on like the, the plucking intonation for the Castilian Spanish. Like you're plucking a guitar, huh? like, uh, is that what you're yeah. talking about? And it, and it has an effect on sounds. And then we have to realize, oh, that same intonation from that is what's present in a South African accent. Like, especially when you get to an African, South African sort of, ex- sort of accent. Right. And like when you're working on that Northern Irish thing, that, element that's that drag there that's that same kind of drag that you can hear in caribbean accents right that you can hear in a lot of accents of the caribbean mm-hmm. and what you can hear in in um the working class mexico all right kid <laughs> right so if you want to do anything to, to keep us, me from things, pulling right. this trigger you better you better belt out a jamaican accent that sounds better than bob marley and you better do it right now all right, let's hear, <laughs> let's hear your Bob Marley, Jimmy, baby. I haven't heard Bob Marley in conversation in a long, long time. All right, well, then sing a song, for God's sake. <laughs> Dance for your <laughs> supper, boy. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay, I'm going to aim this the proper way here. All right, then forget about Bob Marley. Cool. Just do a typical Jamaican guy on the beach. Well... So like when you're at Caribbean accents, when you get to Jamaica, you get folks who tend to say their R's, right? Most of the time, so like a word like hard is gar in it. Whereas when you go to somewhere else, let's say Grenada, you tend to get hard. Hard. It's very hard, right? But okay. when you go to the Caribbean, you go to Jamaica, you tend to get that's hard. It's really All hard. Right. Then what they accent is this? Daylight, come and me want to go home. Daylight, come and me want to go home. That would be singing. That would be right. a Harry Belafonte. But you like are his... doing the uh, little Harry Belafonte. So um, is he it's, Jamaican it's or It's not what? Harry Belafonte. <laughs> Harry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. So that was the seven accents. Okay. Yeah. Those now, are the ones what's that specifically, one? But it's about the toolkit. Yeah. What about that old school fake Indi- English accent? It had a special name to it that all the Hollywood actors had back in the 50s oh, and 40s and 50s. What was that transatlantic called? Transatlantic or mid Atlantic. Yeah, Which that one. Mid Atlantic. All the people who live in the mid Atlantic states hate that it was ever called. But yeah, I like to call it Transmid, Transmid Atlantic, TMA. Okay. Can you yeah. do that? So um, there, you know, you get variations that happen with that accent. A lot okay. of times you get people who have that like really strong twang. There like, you go. Exactly there. Are we making it there? Yes, darling. We're going to be there in about half an hour. Half an hour. Oh. I'm really ready enough to be there that soon. I, I'll take another hour beyond that. So we that don't have a, time to... It sounds a bit British, actually. It is. It's British. Well, it's commonly called like mid-Atlantic, meaning the middle of the Atlantic okay. Ocean. Like there's some oh, in between where people. Speak. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Or transatlantic. You're, where it came from? Dang it. it! It really came from an American um, inferiority complex. Right. I could, I'll buy that. Yeah. Like, oh, if we're going to be proper actors, we have to sound more British. Okay. Um, and that's really where that came from. And with the early films, they were trying to figure out how the hell do we have people speak? And they were going with that because that was the stage standard at that time. Yeah. Right. Very interesting. Shoot. I was, there was another request I had. And now I just, it just fell right out of my mind. Darn it. 
Nope, it's gone. That's well, I'm assuming you can do a John Wayne. Right. I don't know if I can. I don't do impersonations as much. Well, what's the difference between accents and impersonations? Well, well, if I'm, I can emulate someone pretty well. Okay. But I don't necessarily like spot on go for that person. I just don't tend to work on it a whole lot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, there you go. John all right. Wayne from Iowa, after all, come on. I guess you can just talk kind of slow and then that's somewhere. And you think, right. It is, it is a, there is a little bit of a, well, I'm now I'm going towards, Hey there, Bobby. <laughs> what are you? Well, right. you gotta, but there what is you, sort of a text. The John what, you, a little different. what you gotta do is you gotta think slow too, you know? Yeah. He, uh, we kind of went on a, a bender with John Wayne this year, this back in 2021, because my wife rented this awesome place for us to stay through Airbnb up in Wyoming, okay. the John Wayne bus. And it's this, uh, this family that this husband and wife who now run an Airbnb okay. on their old family ranch. And one of the things they have is this bus, 1972 Bluebird bus that John Wayne special ordered built for him. And then he never picked it up. Hmm. And so roundabout this family ended up with it and they have it parked by this river in Southern Wyoming. And it's just this beautiful place. And so there's a picture of John Wayne in the bus, even though he was never actually in the bus cause he never picked it up. But then we started watching a bunch of his movies and he played all these incidental roles and was kind of like really stagnant stagnant for like 10 years or something things were not moving in his direction and then boom stagecoach happened huh. and it exploded we, we we just recently watched that movie again it'd been huh. years since i'd seen it yeah it was his early stuff as john waney as his late stuff uh i think so we didn't watch a bunch of his early stuff because he really was like incidental characters or extras um, yeah mostly westerns because that's what was really hot at that time and he worked well in those um right. yeah yeah wow okay so let's wrap it up oh i know i had a question so dan o'day you said he was your business partner but he is he's also an actor probably isn't he no he actually came from the radio world so okay but so he's he, still oh yeah. that's it that's what i wanted so um so you did the transatlantic fake accent that doesn't even exist beside outside of Hollywood. How about, um, can you do newscasteries? Well, it depends on which news. So broadcast standard these days is sort of a generic, and I like to think of it as generic. So are you looking for, it depends on what you're looking for. Oftentimes you get people that, that what they do is they stress all of the, all of the wrong words in the wrong order, right? So they're stressing all the wrong words, being a broadcast journalist, you know. Okay, but not that, but- Are like, you talking but, about that or are you talking about like Edward R. Murrow, that sort of thing? Not that, that. I'm like, like when I watch the news, I, like I have a friend who, my friend um, from high school, when she talks, when she does her newscast thing, she puts on a voice. That doesn't sound like her. Well, I have to dig. They do something that is about them sort of behaving in a slightly different manner. I'm being very officious. That's the kind of thing you're talking about? Sort of. But I mean, when I hear it, it's like there's a very specific accent to it. But I can like, especially uh, uh, especially the women newscasters, they put on a certain voice mm -hmm. that's like that's a newscaster voice. And, well, and it's most a whole of them are going. In general, they are aiming for something that that we perceive as general American or generic or neutral American or standard American, okay. whatever. It's Midwest ish, okay, uh, or it's Rocky Mountains ish. So how do they you get know, it? I assume that since they the all they all have it, so I assume like they all go to newscasteries school and learn how to talk that way. It depends on the individual. Like a lot of my students. A lot of my undergrad students, they're from Texas, but they don't tend to have typical Texas accents. Huh. Um, they don't tend to have that because when they were in school, they had to not have an accent. Okay. 
And so they've learned to do something that's a little bit neutralish, just, mm. just like I did. Um, I'm originally from Iowa. Like when I go back to my family, we talk, my family talks a little bit more like this, just in general. Okay. And so the way that I speak has shifted a bit from that hmm. most of the time. And to me, I do it all the time now. So it's not, it's not fake. It's just, you know, okay. how I so talk. It feels better on my horse. Are they all like trying to imitate Barbara Walters then or something like that? I mean, to I mean, some degree, but it's, but I think it's less that there is, oh, try to sound like that, that person. And it's much more, oh, you have to have no accent. And that's what people describe it as a lot of times is no accent, or oftentimes they will say broadcast standard. You need to develop your broadcast standard accent. Okay. I can hear, and it's, and it's always a bias against certain things, like especially accents. Okay, so they all, so there is such a thing as broadcast standard, you need to learn how to talk like that. Yeah, but it, I'm also going to call it generic, and it is okay. a neutral ish thing. But I mean, I will say things are changing. Like part of the history of RP is the fact that the BBC required it for all of the people who are going to be professional speakers on the BBC, okay. right? happened is it like in the 70s they started to relax it and go okay we can start to have more regional sounds to it but we still tend to think of something like this on the bbc right but now on the bbc you can you can hear people in their various accents but probably a slightly lighter version of it so that people outside of their region can understand them so they're not sounding like wallace and gromit right then gromit that's, you know, that sort of cartoon Yorkshire there. So instead, <laughs> someone from Yorkshire may actually, you know, be on the news, but say something a little bit more like, a little bit more like this, probably, because they're going for something that is less distinctly Yorkshire that more people in the country would understand than a very localized accent. Okay. And that's sort of the kind of thing that's happening here. There's a little bit more looseness that's coming into it, but there's still a lot of bias against certain accents. So are these newscasters, are they just supposed to figure it out themselves or do they actually have coaches that help them? Yes to both. They are supposed to figure it out. I've worked with some newscasters. Uh, okay. um, they are supposed to figure it out on their own and if they can't, they should hire somebody to help them. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the expectations. And uh, like one person that I worked with, really great reporter, but there was all this bias against her because she had a very Texas sound to her. Okay. Right. And so, so like her agent who was trying to get her some gigs in other, um, in some other um, um, parts of the country was like, I can't, I can't move you. Nobody wants to express an interest in you because you are so Texas. Yeah. Okay. And so she was hitting her head up against the wall when coming to that. Now, I hope that we can start to chill a little bit about that. Like I listen to a decent amount of NPR. NPR is starting to relax a little bit. And I'm starting to hear like more voices of color on NPR. And I'm like, oh, thank you. The thing that's important is that people are clear and understandable. Um, but other than that, it's, it's mostly bias against areas and groups. Since yeah. you brought it up. So what's a voice of color? Like I can hear from somebody that I'm like, oh, you're African-American. Yeah. Hmm. Like commonly in America, you can hear a difference between white speakers and black speakers. Okay. Yeah. That's one example. But the interesting thing is if you listen to someone who's from Africa, that's a completely different accent. Uh-huh. Completely different. Yeah. But people from Africa are black. Uh-huh. I'm not sure where you're going. So, like, why would the way you talk have everything, anything to do with your skin color? Well, because it actually does in the U.S. And it's, it. oh boy. Uh, we, so <laughs> I'm laying a trap things, for you. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I'm going to open the can just a little bit. Okay. But hello, <laughs> welcome to a nation that is built on slavery. 
right? Built on, oh, sorry, it okay. garbled right Slavery then. and segregation. Okay. Oh, sorry. Welcome to a nation that's built on slavery, right? And segregation that continues to this day. I mean, there's still, I'm in Houston. That's a black neighborhood. That's a Latino neighborhood. That's a white neighborhood. Now there are individuals who don't fit that, but mostly neighborhoods are split like that. The, um, um, it's fascinating. There are some maps that you can see online where it has dots, like each dot represents 100 people. And the blue dots represent people who are African-American. The red dots represent people who are Latino. The, so you look at these different dots and you go, oh my God, like that's an Asian neighborhood, like a distinctly Asian neighborhood. That's a distinct, look at Detroit and look at the line that is, um, uh, what is it? Uh, sorry, I am so clueless. The, the mile, the, what is it? I think it's just called a mile, mile. marker. The, it, but the, the street is like eight. What's the the movie with um? Uh, oh, with Eminem in it. Yeah. Okay. So now I can't think of what the name of that movie like is mile, either. Right. If you look at a map of Detroit and the suburbs, you look at that. The line right up to that street is is black. I mean, that's where black people live, and you go immediately north of that street, and that is where white people live. And there's not like right? a Berlin it Wall in between insane. or anything. No, <laughs> but yeah, there is. There is a wall in between, right? Really? I mean, no, a physical not wall, not or, literally, but there's a, a wall of a, thought, a of redlining of of people not getting mortgages because they're not the right color, right? right. Yeah. And yeah. so the moment that you get segregation and grouping of people based on race or skin color or religion or fill in the blank, whatever right? arbitrary thing it is, yeah. you start to get people, people tend to have differences. And so there tend to be differences. Um, where was I? I in was speech. Just, for I would, Yeah, absolutely. I was just in a small town in Oklahoma. Okay. And I was able to speak to two people from that town, a small town of about 2,500 people in Oklahoma. The white woman sounds amazingly different from the black woman. In a town of 2,500. Right. Right. Well, okay. So, I mean, even when I'm at work, there's white people, there's black people, there's Latino, there's Asians, and, and there's people from the Philippines. That's like another... I would yeah. consider another culture unless a race, whatever you want to call it. And it's true. I mean, we all live in Seattle, but we all have a way different way of speaking, basically based on our cult on culture that we grew up in. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The people that you're around the most. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, if you go too far into this, you get yourself in trouble and the internet will have a shark feed, but <laughs> But it is, um, <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, it is, it simply yeah. is. I, that's my take on it too. I mean, and I think that's everyone's take really. If you just sit back and call a spade a spade, it's just, that's unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, because some people have an advantage and others and, and people take advantage of it. But on the other hand, it's also celebrating diversity. It's actually much better that we have all these interesting different ways of being human beings and talking, right? Just from Isn't your point awesome? of view, it's fascinating. Isn't it? Isn't it awesome to go to another country and experience a really different culture and just yeah. go, oh, it's so interesting how it is here. Yeah. Oh my God, we have that within our own country. Yeah. And so, so, you know, as long as we can also celebrate commonalities, oh, you're a decent human being. Oh, right. you're a decent human being. Even even though we're from warring nations, right? That if we can celebrate that we have commonalities while also celebrating that we have differences, huzzah, that actually makes us just a much richer, more wonderful place to be. Great. And it okay. gets variety of accents, which then I love. Yeah. Okay. Well, we do need to wrap it up now. We're, we're, pro cool. we're pushing an hour and a half. So final question is, um, I noticed on your website, you're, um strikingly clean shaven 
Oh, am I? So, um, yeah. And so my question is, is, is this beard forever now or is it a COVID beard or? I don't know. It started a few years ago when um, my wife directed me as Prospero in The Tempest. Okay. And so we found out like at the end of the summer in July going, oh, okay, I'm going to play Prospero next summer. So I grew my beard out that year. Okay. So it was temporary. And then I trimmed it back for the next show that I was in. Okay. And, and it was just like, it just felt good to kind of grow it out. And my wife actually doesn't hate me like this, which is astonishing. So is she actually pro beard or is she just beard tolerant? She's pro, <laughs> she's definitely pro beard over, over clean shaven or, or stubble because that hurts her chin. It will right. be an abrasion. She's pro beard and she's cool with me having this. She's never said anything negative about it. So, okay. Great. I mean, I have a little bit one. You can never really see it on the camera unless you close up. Yeah. But I like it, but I also have shaven parts. So I get both. Right. You know, which is kind of fun. <laughs> okay. So you have an accents class that you're registering for it now, right? Yep. Registration is, is only. I mean, right now, and it ends on Friday. Okay. And this is, there's, there's a lower rate for it. If people register by midnight Eastern time on Tuesday. Right. You get like a $300 discount or something. Wasn't, yeah. that, wasn't that what it was? Yeah. And then also, yeah. but you also have um, throughout the year, you have packages. Like I remember I, I bought, I downloaded and bought your package. Yeah. And I think it was what, like $50 or something like that. Uh, 30 bucks right 30 now. yeah it wasn't very much at all and you have a few there's some a few youtube videos out there for free yeah. examples and then you also do like what what you and i do is we have weekly private lessons over zoom yeah half hour lessons where you and i can we can just go one-on-one -on -one with each other yeah. and i, do I really like that. that i have to limit it because i do a lot of traveling because i'm out recording accents a lot so like right. last year i recorded 200 and some accents. So I was out on the road a lot. You and think like you'll, year, I'm going to hit the road at the end of February and I won't be back sort of in place until near the end of August. So it's going to be a lot of travel. Yeah. So I'm not going to have a lesson for six months. I mean, I'll be in the States for part of that. So we could potentially do a little bit during some of that time, but yeah, that's when I hit the road and I'm, I, I do almost no coaching during that time. Yeah. I'm done. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Well, um, okay. There was something else in there too. Um, before we wrap it up. So then also you also teach, I'm assuming you also just teach normal old college classes. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So you're a pretty busy I'm on guy. I'm sabbatical right now. I'm on a leave from the university for the whole 2021 2022 school year oh i didn't know that okay so that's part of why i've been traveling so much i see um, doing the all the, these dialect recordings and working on my dialect materials and all that yeah when, when they when you go on sabbatical and you're a tenured professor do they, you still get paid during that time i i get paid i like half during okay. this during this time yeah so there's a financial hit but you still get yeah. something wow yeah. and one so like two fifths of my job is as a professor is I am supposed to do things that look good for the university. So basically oh. I am supposed to go and get other work. I see. It's, so you're still doing that part of your job yeah. then. Yeah. Okay. You're supposed to go off and do research and creative work um, um, as a part of the requirement. Of oh, the so job. did you, yeah. so you got a master's degree, but you didn't get a doctorate, right? No, I, and I don't have an MA, I have an MFA, which is considered a terminal degree, meaning if I wanted a PhD, I'd actually have to go back in an MA in order to get a PhD. And I have no interest in a PhD. That okay, I might, I'll try not to make a joke about an MFA. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a mofo actor. That's yeah. What it is. I was going to say, like, I mean, like, were you, did you ever have plans to like, have a book or do like a giant research project or like a thesis that's pulls all this stuff together and, and well i mean that's Jim really Johnson what book. but but my thing is the is the teaching of it or the coaching of the accents mm -hmm. i mean that's what i've created through the 
50 different accents that I have on the site now. I mean, if I wanted wow. to, I could put them into a single book. It would be a huge book. Right. But really, then what my mission is, is, is to do what I can to be teaching accents mm. to others. And so it's about gathering dialect recordings, creating materials that teach mm. the accent, and then guiding people through the thing that I'm enjoying about the accents class is I'm bringing together like it's not just, you're not learning just this accent when you're learning this accent. I want you to learn this accent, but now I want to take elements of that and have you realize that relates to this. Right. And so that this starts to create what I like to think of as your toolkit. Right. Where you are learning to do accents, even in general, on accent, accent, accent. It's starting to add up into, oh, I can take on this one now and I can take on this one now that I, didn't, I couldn't have before. And that would be harder just on its own. But when you start to realize the connection they all have, it becomes easier. And that's part of what I've gained for myself by working on so damn many different accents is what right. do they have in common. Yeah. So, so you can do, like, I think you just said, you can do like 50 different accents. Well, that's what I have available on the site now is 50 different ones. And I've got about as many as 10 more that I may work on over the, you know, up until I die. But how do you keep them all straight? I mean, how do you keep how do you keep one well, how do you prevent one accent from influencing another? There's a little bit of transformation that has to happen. You've got to let yourself become something a little bit different. Yeah. So it's like a you become like a split personality. You gotta yeah. become slightly I schizophrenic. Say, I, I don't hold on to all of those, like I can't just pull out the differences between Baltimore and Philadelphia, you know, at the drop of a hat. Okay. I would have to work on that. Whereas there's there's probably a good 15 to 20 that I can pull out really quickly that I do dialect recordings for people of. Okay. Maybe more. And then that. you also have done some audio books too, right? You have a side gig for that too, don't you? No, I thought you did. No, I don't. I tend to coach a lot of audiobook people. Okay. But I don't, I would I will probably do that at some point. I just don't have time. I'm, right. I'm too busy with all the other stuff I'm doing. Uh, that's, that's a blessing. And uh, I'm assuming part of why you're so busy is because what you do is something that you truly love to do. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. I mean, I love the recording and stuff and I love to travel and I love teaching. That's so great. I feel really, really lucky that so many things have come together. Yeah. So you're living a life that you love. A lot of the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know that term. <laughs> we both know that term. Oh, yeah. It's our little secret. <laughs> <laughs> Dare I mention it? So we I'll just say this. I won't. So we both have done. There's there's like a certain transformational class that we both have participated in. And living the life you love is one of the taglines to it. And I'll have to say, I mean, I took the class 10 years ago and like now I'm like, you know what? I actually am living the life that I love now. So I guess it works. Which is amazing. Awesome. Yeah. 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 So. All right, so how shall we wrap it up now? So, I think we wrap up. We talked through a lot of stuff. We did, which always oh. happens on my show. I tend to throw in lots of tangents, but hopefully pull it back. So yeah. great. So um, oh yeah, so so there's many different ways to benefit from what you have to offer. Uh, the big thing is this this big mega class you're about to embark on. And then there's your website, the accents. It's called the accents help.com. Is that what it's called? Uh, well, the, the class is the accents class dot com. com. Okay. There's that and one. Then, um, and then accent help is accent help.com. Dot com. I'll put all those links in the description. Cool. All right. All right. Now, do you do know a little bit of Star Trek, right? You've watched Star Trek? A little bit. Okay. A little bit. So Finnegan would say like, hey, Jimmy, baby, Jimmy. And then you're going to go like Finnegan. <laughs> Did you okay. watch that one? Do you know that, that one? I don't. But hey. I'll sure believe. Okay, I'll send you the link. It's a classic one. Anyway, so it's been great having you on the show. And then um, I think we already scheduled our next class, me and you, next Thursday or whenever it is. Yep. So um, great. So let's just say goodbye. Thank you. Right. And Thanks, man. We shall meet again. See you later. Yeah.
from Cosmic Ocean. Fantastic creations emerging spontaneously from the space of life. For the benefit of all beings everywhere. We get it.